Time now for another new episode of Forget Me Not, being brought to you by Keck School of Medicine, the University of Southern California. After today's new episode, it's a healthy conversation with Garrett Davis. His guest today is Doris Molina Henry, Assistant Professor of Department of Neurology at the Keck School of Medicine. The topic, help us get ahead of Alzheimer's disease. And now, a new episode of Forget Me Not. y'all to know that we're going to get through this as a family. You just got to remember we got to work and we got to talk things through about your grandfather. Yeah, I know, Dad. It's just, it scared me when he jumped at me like that. Mm. I mean, I know he's confused, but I didn't know he was that confused. We just can't just make sudden moves and we can't sneak up on him. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. TJ, you know I love you, son. You know that, right? Oh, you too, Dad. What? Dad, you know I love you. All right, then. And you too, TJ, with your big fat head. My big fat head? Yes, your big fat head. Girl, don't get me started on your big old bunny rabbit ears. Hold it. Hold it. Stop. Let's find something to do. Don't matter. Matter of fact, I know what you can do. Go to the rooms. Clean up. I know they're junky. Yeah. His room is junky. Let's do my song. No. You too. See y'all at dinner time. TJ, you have getting too long. That's your problem. That's your problem. Hey, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. I see you have blue, but I change it back. I, I, I make it black. Yeah. Don't eat your neck still pop. Daddy's beginning to be a handful. <laughs> How's TJ? He's gonna be fine. You know, I talked to him and Brenda and, you know, I didn't even know TJ had them kind of feelings. You know, he's real concerned about your father. Daddy didn't mean any harm. He was just confused. No, 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 okay, it's okay. You know, I talked to him, I explained, you know, everything, what was going on and, you know, he understands, they understand. But, uh, how's your father? I mean, how is he being at home by himself? Mr. Bill is staying with my dad, and because Miss Bill is out of town, so. Uh, Renee, I want you to hear me, right? And I don't want you to take any offense to what I'm about to say. But I think it's time for us to find some kind of assistance, you know, for caregiver for your father. Theo. Baby, baby, just, just hear me out, hear me out. I know you're at this state where you got to take care of your father. you got to defend your father. you got to explain your father. But I think we're at the point now where we need to know what this all time is this doing to him. And I think the best option is for us to, to find some options for caregiving to help you. Because it's not just affecting you. It's affecting all of us. Okay. I hear you. I do. Okay. I hear you. But I'm gonna go upstairs and I'm gonna check on TJ, okay? I promise, we'll talk about it later. We gotta do what's best for him, Renee. I'm thinking about it. Good afternoon. It's good to see you again, Kim. And how are you today, Mr. Jameson? Well, I'm doing fine. My daughter thought it would be a good idea if I signed up for this study. Since our friend June is experiencing Alzheimer's. Well, I applaud you, Kim, for being an advocate in this matter. And you too, Mr. Jameson, for willing to participate in this study. I understand. But you know, if I were being honest, at first, I didn't want no parts of this. But after Baby Girl explained to me how important this was to our community to take part so that we would understand Alzheimer's better. I wanted to do my part. And of course that may help lead to a cure. 
Well, unfortunately, Mr. Jameson, you will not be able to participate in the study. What do you mean? Why can't my father participate? So your father has diabetes, so he will not be able to participate in this study. My little sister passed away from this disease. So did my mother. Now you said this would be a good thing for us to do. I understand your frustration, but we have strict guidelines that we have to follow. I mean, so what do we supposed to do in the meantime? Is there another study? I want you and your father to consider signing up for one of our clinical trial registry. Okay. Let me read some information to you both, just to give you a little bit of a better understanding, okay? So the registry, it's like a collection of information about individuals. There are different types of people with specific diagnosis or conditions, and these registries connect people interested in being participants with various studies. So what's the difference between registries and studies? So registry studies are observational. They look backwards at what was done without dictating a treatment plan. So, Clinical trials look forward to what shall be done. Exactly. Clinical trials are investigational and dictate and control the treatment plan. So registries are observational and clinical trials are investigational. You got it. So I would still be able to help our community if I took part in this registry. Right. So the registry can be used to recruit patients for a clinical trial, to learn more about a particular disease or condition to learn about population behavioral, right? Patterns and their association with the disease development. <laughs> well, sounds good to me. What are my next steps? Let me gather some information so that I can go over it with both of you. Sounds good? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. It's okay, babe. When at least I can still do my part to help fight Alzheimer's. Mm Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Dad and I just talked about it. I guess I didn't realize that Grandpa wouldn't know who I was. It's not you. It's the disease. And Alzheimer's can be a difficult disease to understand. Yeah, but I just wish he knew who I was. I guess I should have come around more often. Don't blame yourself. What you need to do now is you need to make new memories with your grandfather. How do you always seem so calm when everything seems like it's falling apart? Is that what it seems like? <laughs> I wish my mom was like you. I say one thing and then suddenly she just goes off on me. Okay, what you're not gonna do, you're not gonna compare me to your mother. Your mom is doing the best that she can, TJ. And I am sure that you have done some things to provoke her as well. Now, I know you said not to compare, but she's always working and she's never really around. Okay, stop it. Your mom is a single mother who is trying to make, make it for you and her. So what you need to do, TJ, is you need to meet her halfway. I guess you're right. So, uh, when is Grandpa coming back over? He's coming tomorrow. 
So what you need to do is make new memories. Wow, Mom. I've been calling and texting you for an hour and no response. But as soon as you come home, you check on TJ? Tell me what happened with Jim and TJ. Oh, you really want to know? Well, let me tell you, it appears that TJ was sneaking up on June, and June would have one of them flashbacks, you know, like he was in the old days in the war, and before you know it, June would snatch that boy by his neck, put him in the headlock. <laughs> Ooh, scared the mess out that child. Oh my God. She should have been there. Wow. June something else, don't mess with June now. Well, you know, Renee called me. She did. And told me that, you know, she was gonna set up an appointment for June because she wanted to check on the progression of his Alzheimer's. You know, this thing is getting serious. This Alzheimer's in June. I don't know how long he gonna be able to stay in this house by himself. Yeah, you're right. Well, tell me what happened with your study. Oh, I'm doing good. I'm learning new things every day. Them people over there at the health center, they take their time and they explain everything to me. I really appreciate them. They work good with me. That's good. You know what, that's funny because I used to think people participating in those clinical trials mm -hmm. was signing up to be guinea pigs. Guinea? Look, see, see that, that's the problem right there. You're thinking too much. The miseducation of our people is the reason why we're held back. Look, we just have to work with Things like clinical trials. That's going to help us. Those are the very things we need. You're right. Well, guess what? What's that? I started a group for caregivers. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I just want to be able to give back, you know, and make sure the information that's out there is used. You know, I can see you doing something like that because you work good with people. You know, the information is out there. The, the thing is this, this. We just got to make sure that our people understand, trust, and believe in the process. Mm -hmm. Then we'll get somewhere. You're right, Uncle Bill. All right, now. You know all right. Yolanda, where is my son? Uh, what are you doing here? Well, baby, when you text me about Mr. June, I called you, you didn't pick up. I called your father, he didn't pick up. I mean, does anybody have a phone in here? Okay, you know what? You're not gonna come into my home and disrespect me, okay? Now, Theo was working late last night, and he's working late again tonight. So that's the reason why he did not answer the phone, okay? It was a misunderstanding, but everything is all right now. <laughs> I'll be the judge of that if you don't mind. Mom, why are you tripping? Why you gotta disrespect Miss Renee like that? <laughs> what did we talk about earlier, TJ? Did we have a conversation earlier? In your room, remember that conversation. Mom, I'm sorry for disrespecting you and I'm sorry for not calling you earlier. You have never taken accountability for your own actions. What's gotten into you? Well, you told me I needed to get my stuff together. Well, you didn't exactly say stuff. All right, I know what I said. And it was me that provoked you. I'll try to do better, I promise. I'm sorry for how I came in earlier. It's okay. Since you're here, you might as well join us for dinner. Are you sure? I don't want to be a trouble. No, you're fine. We can all just sit down and have a conversation. Welcome to another edition of Healthy Conversations. And today I have with me, I will call her my sister. She's a good friend and she's with the Keck School of Medicine. Doris Alina Henry, how are you doing? 
I am doing great, Karen. <laughs> great to be here. <laughs> Thank you for taking time on your schedule. So what we've been doing um, after the, you know, the episodes of Forget Me Not, we've been uh, having these healthy conversations. But even before we get into the conversation, I want people to know who we're talking to. So where are you from, Doris? So I am in California. I'm actually part of the faculty of the Keck School of Medicine. Uh, and I am based in San Diego as I am part of the Alzheimer's Therapeutic Research Institute. So how did you get into this field? So I was trained as a neurobiologist. So I did do work in neuroscience, uh, particularly in mice and rats. So mostly animal research and became very interested more in the disease mechanisms, things that affect our brain. So I was already on the path for brain research after um, having, having uh, gone through different programs and then decided that I wanted to take the leap into Alzheimer's and started working um, very with a local institution as an affiliate faculty member just to learn more about Alzheimer's disease and became very, very engaged with the, with the mission of finding a way to treat this disease and learned about so many things that were in place to advance and accelerate a way to, mm -hmm. to change the course for so many people that will suffer from that disease in the future. Right. When we say research and people of color in yeah. clinical trials, a lot of times they don't all go into the same bowl mm -hmm. evenly. Um, right. So how has it been, you know, being in this field of research in terms of of seeing other people that look like you? Is that a, is that a small window? <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's so interesting to walk into meetings and conferences and, you know, workspaces and you're one of the few. Mm -hmm. um, and I know what's exciting at this time is seeing so many more people being involved in changing that, that there's really a stronger push in making sure that there are more, there's more representation, people that look like me, mm -hmm. both, you know, in, in terms of race as well as gender, right? And, and that, that we're there and that we can bring those lived experiences, perspectives that can really help us push forward to support and benefit individuals that are often not um, not as supported, not as taken care of in our communities. And the reason I ask that question is because when we do conversations like mm -hmm. this, you know, I wanted to be candid from the standpoint, it's very rare or can be rare that mm -hmm. those are in this field, you know, do not look like the people that we're trying to reach. And anytime yeah. we have a person of color or, you know, um, talking about the space, I want them to know how they got into it, why they're into it before we just jump into the space. Cause it's important yeah. that we understand, you know, research. So, Break down research because, you know, when we say research and clinical trials, I want people to know, you know, the difference mm -hmm. between research and clinical trials. So if you could break down that's, the difference between research and clinical trials. That's a great point, Garrett, because I think we use these words so loosely because you often hear from people that are in, in research talking about these things as though the world understands and, and it's common language. And so when we talk about research, we talk about any investigation that is done under a certain design systematically so that we can answer a given question. In clinical research, we're talking about a given question in the clinical space. So let's talk about Alzheimer's, for example. When we're talking about Alzheimer's, that becomes a clinical condition and uh, a disease, a disease that we're trying to tackle and trying to treat. And so we're in that clinical space, but we have to answer questions about how that disease changes the individual, affects their health, affects their well-being. So you bring in questions, but you design studies around those questions that allow you to answer them concretely, not without a shadow of a doubt. Research will never be without a shadow of a doubt, but can allow you to make, with the way in which you've looked at that question, you can make some, some educated um, in, uh, conclusions about what, what the disease is. Then we also look at research from the perspective of not only understanding the disease, but how can we treat a disease? How can we slow a disease? How can we treat how it affects people, the symptoms of the disease? And that's typically within Alzheimer's disease, which is the area that I focus on, we, we typically are looking at those three things within the area of treatment. Okay. Uh, and that is making sure that we're delaying, we're, we're making sure that we're slowing, or making sure that we're treating the symptoms. So to improve quality of life. So that's, I'm sorry, and you asked me for research, so that's research okay. itself. And then when we talk about clinical trials, then these are studies designed to look at one specific treatment 
in a specific population that has a specific presentation of that disease to see if that treatment is beneficial and is safe to treat this, the condition that, it, that we're trying to treat. And I promise our viewers, we are going to get into the conversation about, you know, uh, you know some, some options for clinical trials, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into what do you think the disconnect is when it comes to people of color and researching clinical trials? You know, how, 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 you know what's the disconnect then too? How do we begin to kind of bridge that gap? Yeah, you know, this is a conversation that I'm so glad we're having here, but I'm so glad that we're having in general. I mm -hmm. think oftentimes that conversation was swept under the rug because it's an uncomfortable conversation and that there are a myriad of reasons. You know, you can't ask somebody depending on, on the community or depending on, on their background, if they have other bigger pressing things to participate in something that they're not as familiar with. So I think it's not been mainstream for our communities, what research in general or clinical trials in general. They're not been, the studies have not appeared to be as open and as inclusive of all individuals. They've typically been conducted with a majority of a population being white. That's the history, that's the history of things. That's also who participates by virtue of knowing more. Um, there's the mistrust issue. And I think that's the one that we're most familiar with. You know, the term, the term often comes to mind of, I don't want to be a guinea pig, right? And I mean, <laughs> and I don't want to be a lab rat. And I, that resonates with me as well. I, I think my perspective has changed because I was the one doing the studies. Mm -hmm. And so I think all these looming, looming issues, these looming questions, these concerns have not often been addressed. I think from the researcher side, we often come into a community speaking our language rather than listening and understanding what the concerns within that community are before we try to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's, 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 it's that and a number of other things. I mean, some that are easier to tackle and others that are not. I think that's a big, big disconnect. Yeah. And the abuses of, of power that have occurred historically in this country have contributed a lot to that mistrust as well and still occur, unfortunately. And all of that that takes place and that, that, that took place, you know, over the years, you know, mm -hmm. I think sometimes the thing that, that bothers me is we still allow that to be a stumbling block to not trust. And mm -hmm. I do, you know, I, I say it all the time, you know, I hate what happened with Tuskegee and, you know, it was, it was awful. You know, it was awful what they did. It was awful how long it went on. You know, I won't say, but I will say, however, because of Tuskegee, things are so much, so, so different now, you know, um, it, you know, we can trust now because of Tuskegee, you know, I will say that. I think, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we allow things that have happened in the past to be a stumbling block, you know, because I would hate for them to come up with a cure for Alzheimer's disease and it doesn't mm -hmm. work in us because we didn't participate in clinical trials. Absolutely. And the Absolutely. basic fundamental thing I want, you know, our viewers you know, to understand is that when you go to Walmart, when you go to CVS, every drug that's on the shelf went through a clinical trial. Yes. Every one, every last drug, the mm -hmm. anesthesia, the Excedrin, the, the, the BB powder, everything went through a clinical trial. And if there are not enough participants from our community taking part in those clinical trials, then how it works in us is going to be varied and it's going to be different. And yes. so we don't want that. And so the only the way we can, and so what happens, we play Russian roulette and that's why you can put, I'll say you put 10 black people in the room, they all had a headache and they're all taking 10 different things because, yeah. you know, you know, we got to have good representation. So I think I want to start the conversation now with, you know, it's important to understand what a clinical trial is. We've talked about the research because every time we say clinical trial, you know, we don't always assume that it's something you got to put put in your body. There are different types of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. But if you kind of go into the different types of clinical trials um, that there are, um, and then we'll come back with that. Yes. You know, Garrett, and along with what you said, what you said is all so very true. And we we keep having this conversation. If we if we don't engage, we won't know how it works. But I, I want to really emphasize what you've said. Every medication at the drugstore that we take, that we're required to take, because when the symptoms hit, when that headache hits, when that cold hits, when that flu hits, we need it. We know where to go. We know where to get it. It has undergone a clinical trial. In a way, we don't trust, but we're trusting every time we take a medication. We're missing the piece of being involved enough to ensure that that medication is vetted for people that look like you and me that have similar backgrounds. And so 
I think in a way we're trusting, but we're trusting a little bit late in the in the story mm -hmm. when we could really be a part of it and also make sure that things are designed in a way or or tested in a way that we know for a fact that they're going to be beneficial for us, for our kids, for our grandkids in the future to come. And so the, the science will move on. Clinical mm -hmm. trials will continue. People will continue to participate. We will continue to find drugs. The question is, will we find drugs that we can we can say, because we've participated, because we've been a part of these studies, that they're going to be effective and safe in us? Right. And so yeah. my mother has Alzheimer's disease, and my sister is the primary caregiver. And one of the questions she asked me was, you know, Garrett, where do I go to find out about a clinical trial? Yeah. You know, so how does a person you know, whether it's my sister who's taking care of someone with Alzheimer's disease or just someone who just, you know, who's been affected by a friend, how do they know where to go to, yeah. to find out about clinical trials? Because it's not like, you know, you can just, where, where do they go? <laughs> they don't, yeah, because it's, trials are conducted all over the country, right? And some of these trials are, you know, the same trial, but they have different places that are actually executing that trial. So it is, it's, it seems as, it's though, as though it is hard to find. One easy way to start is to go to clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov has registered all clinical trials that are ongoing. And they, this is where the, the, these studies are required to have a number from that entity to ensure that these are being tracked and that they are made accessible to the, to the public. Another way that I feel may be a little less intimidating because, you know, when we say go to a website and now we find 143 trials, which is about <laughs> what we have right now in 2022 on 40 different types of compounds, that can get very intimidating. But I think it's going to your trusted medical facility and finding out what trials they have ongoing for Alzheimer's disease. And if it's not the closest one, are there others around? I can talk to you about a specific t study, and I know we will at some point. But I think just to understand that that, that would be the easiest part the easiest approach to finding finding out what's available, what's available in my area, what's available within my radius of comfort, trust, and, and the providers that I'm already seeing. If you have family members, right, as you do, that are suffering with the disease or there are concerns, your neurologist is going to be the first person that you'll see after your PCP. The neurologist yeah, will be- I want, I, want, I want to cut you off. You That's said neurology. Yeah. A, a lot of times, um, and I'm from a very small town, Warren, Warrington, North Carolina, and, you know, the town doesn't have a hospital anymore. They have, mm -hmm. you know, people in Warrington have to drive to Henderson to get some care. And then the next stop from there is the Raleigh Durham Research Triangle area. So it could be 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And so, you know, we throw the term neurologist around because yeah. we're in the field. But, you know, I want to I want to stand up for, for some people who like it. Okay, so what's a neurologist? Yeah. You know, because they go to that family doctor and I want them to understand that family doctor may be good in one area. But mm -hmm. then I want I want to empower those that are taking our loved ones to the doctor that when it comes to warning signs of Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and dementia, you know, do not feel bad to seek additional um, guidance from a neurologist. That's that's our word for the day. So to yeah. kind of break down and tell everyone, you know, the importance of a neurologist versus just a, a family doctor or someone like that. Right. So your family doctor is a general practitioner. They've studied mm -hmm. medicine. They they have a breadth of knowledge about a number of conditions so that they can treat your day to day. Your neurologist comes in as neuro from the root neuro, which is brain. Um, is your person who specializes specifically, they've taken an additional education and training to dig into how the brain works. What are the signs and symptoms that the brain isn't working the way that it should and understanding what is the prognosis, what's going to happen down the road or how can we best intervene? And so when we're, we're thinking about that and, and we have individuals that have concerns about their brain health specifically, your PCP will be able to treat you generally with their breadth of knowledge. But the, the next step will be to refer you and send you to somebody who specializes in that brain health and is able to run the adequate test to be able to decide what it is that's happening, what's changing, and how can we approach it 
so that we can get on a plan, that person can get on a plan of care. And so that's your, your specialized individual. And that person, particularly for Alzheimer's and other dementias, becomes the, the, um, the guide uh, mm -hmm. or that, that next stage in terms of managing that, that condition. So I want to I want to take our viewers in stages. And so mm -hmm. the holidays are coming up and we're going to yeah. have people come in from out of town, family members who haven't seen mom or dad in a while. And mm -hmm. so on every show, I've always stated and I'll state again on this one before you get back in your car and get in your plane. You know, I want the siblings to sit down, and have a conversation, talk about did you notice anything different about mom or dad? Mm -hmm. um, did you did you notice these things? And don't be afraid to 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 seek additional help for questions. Because I think once we, you know, we see signs, then we have to admit that we see the signs because we, sometimes we can be in denial. Mm -hmm. Once we admit that the signs are there, then we have to get courage enough to go to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. Then we have to um, accept the, the doctor's analysis and diagnosis. And then we have to figure out what to do. Okay. And it seems like all of those steps, what gets left out or never gets considered are clinical trials. We try yeah. to put a plan together for caregiving. We try to put a plan together for finances. We try to put a plan together for comfort and, and, and quality of yeah. life. But we never look at clinical trials as an option. And yeah. I want to challenge and encourage those families that are caring for a loved one um, and dealing with dementia, Alzheimer's, to please consider um, clinical trials as an option. So let's talk about some of the benefits before we get into some of the options, the benefits of taking part in a clinical trial. Because there are some benefits to doing that. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, oftentimes I think what's a little bit tricky is we think direct benefit means that it's likely going to fix a problem. You, right. I think we, we have this erroneous idea that the trial is, is destined to work. Most trials don't. Most drugs may mm. not necessarily do what we're hoping for them to do. That's why they're there so that we know whether they're in, they're in fact going to engage what they're in, intended to engage and treat what they're intended to treat. Um, nonetheless, they, they need to be done and undergoing that process is required and necessary. It's a safe, it's not, it's the, the I would say the most, one of the ways in which you can most confidently know that you're being monitored while you're taking a medication mm -hmm. uh, or taking an investigational treatment. When you go to the pharmacy, nobody's watching what you're taking and if it's affecting your liver. But here, everybody is watching and monitoring any, any and every little change in you and any new symptom or any adverse effect. And so that's one of the encouraging things of participating in that as opposed to, well, I'll take this medication that now has been approved, but nobody like me participated. So we'll find out if it works or not, right? So that's one, one of those benefits that we don't necessarily contemplate. There's often financial, often, or I will say almost every, every, every study has financial compensation for their participants. And that may vary in very, very few cases, but there's always financial compensation. And that's described in a document that is shared with the prospective participants. So let's say that you're contemplating participating in a clinical trial. And let me know if I'm moving too, too fast through this. Mm -hmm. here. Um, but there's a document called a consent form. It's an informed consent form. That consent form, which did not exist in the times of Tuskegee and did not exist in, the, in these other times, is there to ensure that everything that will happen in that trial is outlined in a way that you and me and the lay public can understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That form is a form that is required for every study and is, it, you should be able to understand it to make that decision. Otherwise, you, you're not, it's your only way of participating in a trial. And in that, that particular form, the compensation for the study is discussed, the procedures in the study are discussed, the treatment that, the investigational treatment that will be used is discussed, the potential for adverse effects, anything to expect, how to react, what to do, et cetera. And most importantly, and I wanna put like an underline under this, okay. is the statement that you can withdraw from the study at any time. You can commit to a study, that does not mean that you have sold your soul. <laughs> it simply means that, hey, you know what? Today I feel that I can do this, I want to do this because I think it's important for me, for my community, for the world, for Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. And you may decide this is just not for me anymore. You can always withdraw. 
in, in the vein of benefits so that we're talking about compensation, we're talking about autonomy. You own your decision-making power throughout the study. Um, but I also think that there's the general benefit, which is more altruistic as the reason why I'm doing this is the reason why you're doing it. You may not be affected directly, but to know that there will be something out there available because I was involved uh, when the time comes, if I ever need it or if others need it. So there are a myriad of benefits that don't often translate into the direct benefit to me. But I think hugely for us, for our communities, for individuals that look like you, that look like me, to be able to to make sure that our we count and we are counted within that study, these studies is is hugely important as a, as also, a group. Yeah, I also think that you know by taking part, it gives you a sense of comfort because okay. you're going to learn, you're going mm -hmm. to be educated on everything that is taking place. And I think you're once you become knowledgeable and you understand what's taking place and why it's taking place, you under, understand things. It gives you a certain comfort level. And then now you begin to impart that information onto your other members of your family. And so you can look at this as becoming an ambassador for, you know, you could you could be the start of educating your family about the comfort level of doing something like this and how important it is, you know, for, for the community to take part in. But it's I guess it could start in your own home. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yes. And I think, you know, I, I remiss that I. I didn't consider that and think about it as a benefit per se, but I think you're so right, Garrett. I mean, how would you know that you're at risk until you kind of participated in something? And you may think, well, I may not want to know. I mean, I'd rather not know. Um, but this is the kind of disease, particularly when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, that time is of the essence. The mm -hmm. sooner you know that you're A, at risk, the sooner you know that you're, you you have that gene, genetic makeup that you that makes you more likely, the sooner you can make some changes, the sooner you can get involved in the conversation, the more support you can rally, the more conversations you can have. And I think that we take that for granted. But I, we learn so much from these processes. We, we, it brings us comfort. It brings us understanding. And it allows us to be those ambassadors in our communities to, to move things forward. Right. And I think, you know, at some point, because we live in the world where there are more people over 65 than under 17, at some point, you know, we're going to be taking care of someone and someone's going to be taking care of us. And I think by getting out in front, this is a way to get out in front of the disease is by getting as much information that we can gain as possible. So let's talk about some studies that, that mm -hmm. you know, that, that are out that I think we should um, look at. Yeah, so I will share some of the studies that I'm involved in at the <laughs> Alzheimer's Therapeutic Research Institute. So what we are is a, a coordinating center, if you would, for clinical trials. And so... There are a number of clinical trials that are going on and they're happening at different locations. But one study that I'm extremely excited about and that I work on is the AHEAD study. Um, and our hope is that we can get ahead of Alzheimer's. Okay. So, you know, yes. Uh, so, you know, Alzheimer's, we, we always think about it because people start losing their memory. And I wanted to bring this up just as a, as a side, side note. We often think that losing your memory with age is a normal thing. Oh, well, you know, mom just, you know, she's just getting forgetful, but you know this, you and I know this. Mm -hmm. uh, that forgetfulness, there's a certain level of forgetfulness that is not memory loss. Memory loss and the disappearance of just pieces of, of that memory of that individual is a disease. It's not normal. And we don't necessarily have to live with it. Um, it just happens to be something that has been happening for a while. And so, Having made made that um, that statement with the AHEAD study, our goal has not been to just treat the disease when it's happening, is to go back and treat the disease before it begins to cause these problems. So the things that happen in the brain to take us to the, the characteristic symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, like memory loss, which is what people typically attribute to or associate with Alzheimer's disease, begin to happen about 20 years before that person starts to lose their memory. Hmm. So if you're at risk, those changes are happening in your brain and nobody knows for 20 years. At 20 years, now the signs show up. Now you're starting to notice that 
you forgot that appointment, but never remembered it. It's not the same. So another re great resource for people that are, are learning and have just found out or have a relative or are coming back from the holidays is go to the Alzheimer's Association website because they have a lot of examples and information on how to distinguish some of these subtle changes early on. But, you know, it's the, it's the person that forgets that they had an appointment or forgets to pay the bill on time uh, is, is normal, you know, when you're in your 60s. But the person that never remembers that they ever had that appointment, the person that never remembers um, that that bill even existed, that person is now beginning to suffer from other changes that are more, more that may be indicative of a disease. So our goal with the study is to engage and bring in a group of people, about 1,400 people, that will that are at high risk for this disease because those changes are happening in their brain already. So let's, that, talk, let's talk about high yeah. risk. How, how would I know? Because mm -hmm. I've had several members in my family mm -hmm. to be uh, inflicted with that disease, would, would, that, would, would I be considered high risk? That's correct. Okay. So a family history puts us at risk. Mm -hmm. There are certain genes that put us at risk. Um, and that gets a little bit more confusing because you have to go somewhere and get that genetic result. But definitely things that we can see that we can detect that tell us that we're high risk include having, having a family history, certain comorbidities make us more likely. So the, in the combination of these things, like family history and comorbidities, and by comorbidities, I mean other conditions like mm -hmm. hypertension, diabetes, all these have been very tightly associated with increasing your risk mm -hmm. of Alzheimer's later in life. Um, you have things like um, race and ethnicity not by virtue of there being any biological element to our race and ethnicity, but our, our history, our lifestyle, um, our exposures are different. And that actually makes us more likely to, to be, be more at risk. And we know this because black individuals are two times as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease compared to whites. Latino individuals are one and a half times as likely to develop the disease mm -hmm. more than whites. So by virtue of that, we know that it's a, a, that we're at higher risk. So it's a combination of things, but we don't know what those, what, what those things, uh, what, what's happening in our brain at that early, early stage until those signs begin to appear. Okay. So keep talking about that. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. So keep talking. No, about no, no, no. That's great. And so, so, so those are some of our risk factors. And being able to, to, to identify individuals that already have these risk factors early on opens the door for us to say, hey, let's pre-screen you. Let's, let's kind of see if you pre-qualify for this study. One of the things that we don't talk about a lot, particularly in the context of clinical trials, is that these studies are testing an investigational treatment that is, is intended to treat a specific thing in the brain or in the body. So that means that that specific thing needs to be present. With Alzheimer's disease, there's just a lot of mechanisms, a lot of things that are happening. So with this AHEAD study, our goal is to bring in these individuals that are high risk by virtue of some of those risk factors that I mentioned. If those individuals um, are, are pre-eligible, then they can take a simple blood test. That simple blood test tells us, gives us an idea of what their brain levels of a protein that's been related to Alzheimer's disease are. And that protein is called amyloid. And that may be, it's not a buzzword, um, right. but mm -hmm. uh, it is in our, in our, in the scientific community, it's the thing that we're really hoping to break down and to clear so that it doesn't damage your brain, it doesn't damage your brain cells. And so our goal is to introduce this investigational treatment in individuals that have intermediate and moderate levels of that, that protein in their brain and treat them for a while to see if this medication in fact does what we hope that it does. Now, when we say hope that it does, mm -hmm. we've already been testing this medication. We're getting into phases of determining that it's actually as effective as we hope that it is. We know that it's safe. It's been right. tested for that. So your trials are in phases. We know that it's safe. Now we need to make sure that it works and that it works well for everyone, for the majority of people that are in the study. And so AHEAD walks you through that. The investigational mm -hmm. treatment, I will say, Garrett, mm -hmm. is exciting because I'm at a conference right now 
And it has just been breaking news. Top line results have come out for the investigational treatment in that study. And it has found to be effective in reducing, the, slowing the cognitive decline in individuals that already had mild cognitive impairment. That means wow. they were already showing signs wow. of, of the disease. So if we could do this earlier, the implications of that could be huge. That treating even earlier, some people may not ever have to suffer from that disease that are already destined to suffer from that disease. And I think that's exciting. Yeah, the, the amazing thing to me, and I guess the, the part that's hard for me to put my mind around, you know, like, like 20 years before we see a symptom, you know, how do we know? Yeah. How do, I mean, how do we know to even walk down that aisle of, let mm -hmm. me get tested for this? Because by the time we see a sign, you know, that's, we should have done it 20 years ago, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's hard, right? It's hard. And I think the good thing is in this field, we're looking at Alzheimer's at all stages. We're not just looking at individuals that are at risk. We're, we're trying to treat those that are sick, those that are far along, those that are suffering from certain symptoms. So there's, there's treatments that are being worked on right now for everything. But for this particular thing that you pointed out, we can't see it. So that puts us at a disadvantage. We don't yet have the blood test to, to do it, to say, yes, for sure, you're going to get it. However, we do know risk factors. And the risk factors that I mentioned already tell us that, hmm, maybe I should see if I can possibly get involved because I will get information from this. I might get some information from this study. And you, and you might, and you will, you'll get some information. You won't necessarily know that you will or will not get the disease. What you will know is if you're eligible to participate. And then you, if you are, you have access to a medication that could be life-changing. Wow. Um, that could be. Emphasis on that. Because until it is FDA approved. Proof, right. Exactly. <laughs> we don't know that it is, right? And so we, we do trust that entity because they, they do make the right decision before they release those medications. And they have to have demonstrated an efficacy level substantial enough to 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 make it available. Wow. Doris, thank you so much for joining us today and having this healthy conversation about clinical trials and research. Uh, if someone wants to find out more about their head study, regardless of where they are, meaning state or city, how, how, how can they do that? Yes, it's simple. Go to the head study website. It's aheadstudy.org. Mm -hmm. And there you will have information about the study. And you can even see if you can pre-qualify. It'll walk you through simple questions that really look at the fact that of whether you are at risk or not, and you might be a good candidate. And then if you are and you move past that, then you can you you can be invited to have a blood simple blood test done to determine if you can move into the next phase of the study. Right. So that's a simple, easy way to to get involved. Take All the right. first. Doris, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you, Garrett. It's a pleasure. <laughs> All right. This has been a healthy conversation here on G Davis TV. And to find out more about these, go to G Davis TV. You can download it. Uh, we're streaming on Roku, Amazon Fire, and Apple TV. You can go to any mobile device and go to the App Store and download G Davis TV. Have a great day. This has been Healthy Conversations with Garrett Davis. Make sure you follow us on G Davis TV, streaming on Roku, Amazon Fire, and Apple TV, or any mobile device.